Welcome back to the Packard Bell Executive Multimedia Experience, aka Trash to Treasure Part 2, and I've lost count of the number of times I saw the phrase Packard Hell used in the first part in the comments section, but you can't stop me. I'm going to make this thing look like new, despite your comments and despite parcel couriers. Stick around because it's going to get worse before it gets better. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com and we thank them for their support. It's not a pile of junk, it's a beautiful Packard bell waiting to uh, shine once again. There's the front fascia from it. Hello Cave Dwellers, you may remember we started looking at this just before Christmas. Uh, we had just the desktop unit which was looking pretty filthy and we went out and we did some shopping. First of all we looked at some magazines to see what this should look like if we're to restore it to look like brand new and here are some of those images and then we went out and shopped to try and source the exact parts that we would need to um, bring this all back together and get that new experience. Well, I'm pleased to say it took a while, but here's lots of stuff on the desk that has arrived so we can progress with that build. And in today's episode, we're going to unbox, we're going to test things like the monitor here, which was sold as working. So, you know, I know these things are old, they might pop within five minutes of using, but I, I, I hope they do work. And um, we'll test that today. We'll assess what cleaning we need to do, maybe some retro brighting, and we'll just plan all of that out for episode three, which is when we'll, we'll, we'll really dive into that cleaning process. And um, I also want to test the system board, to see if there's any life in the machine itself and the hard drive, that original hard drive. Will it have the click of death or will it be working well enough just to grab an image from it and put it onto something I've got here which is thoroughly modern and will make for more practical use in the modern day. So part two of our Packard Bell Executive Trash to Treasure. Let's start unboxing with, um, I think we should start with the monitor. Monitors, what safer thing to buy and ship on eBay? This looked a little bit yellow on the listing, but it comes from a seller with a good feedback rating and was shown working. It cost me 55 pounds, including shipping, and I was surprised to see that it was in its original box covered with all those happy faces. And then when we spin it around, that distinctive Packard Bell face logo. Now there was no damage on the box and it was packed really well. Frustratingly well, in fact, because when we get inside, you can see that pretty much an entire office worth of shredding has been dumped into this box. But I really can't complain about this. It's one of the most well-packaged boxes I've ever received off of eBay. But my optimism would soon turn into something else. Just have a listen to the sound of this leaving the box. It appears that despite the good packing, the monitor was perhaps against the wall of the box and so when it was dropped by the courier, it took the full impact, the shock devastating the brittle old plastics and working their way all the way through the casing and just shattering it to pieces. It's such a shame. The tube itself is broken away from all four corner mounts and it's just resting on top of the PCB. Peering inside, I expected to see the neck of the monitor or the PCB itself broken or cracked, but amazingly, that doesn't seem to be the case, at least on first inspection. I'd later pull the tube out and take a closer look at it, and it may actually be salvageable for parts. So I'm not gonna be putting this in the bin, don't worry. And as we work around, you can see there is the neck of the monitor there, still in one piece, and that PCB looks fine. I've kept the speakers too, but the rest of the case, I'm afraid, is just junk. So we're back to square one with the monitor. It's not gonna hold us up today. We can progress without the monitor, but um, if we're gonna complete this whole series, we do need to get hold of one. So if you happen to have one, if you know that granny's got one in the loft that she might be willing to sell to me, please do get in touch and let me know because if we're gonna get this looking exactly like the machine in the catalog, which is our goal, we're gonna need that monitor. Next, it's onto keyboards and I ordered not one, but two. This is the first and thank goodness it's not smashed to pieces and it's new old stock by the looks of things. 
There's absolutely no wear on it, and it's only really let down by a slightly yellowing sticker on the spacebar, and we can easily remove that. Hopefully nobody will strain themselves without the warning to stop them. Looking around the keyboard, the top of the plastics has that same wavy finish as the front of the PC case, so it's definitely a good match. It's the same keyboard that we saw in the original catalogue image, I'm 100% sure of that, and um, this was a good find for our project. But you may be asking, why do I have two keyboards? Well, if you watched part one, you'll know that I took pity on an eBay special. And as I open it, you'll probably agree that murder gloves are definitely in order before touching the thing. A device that looks like it's been chain smoking for 30 years. Surprisingly, as I opened it, there aren't actually any unpleasant smells coming from it, as you might expect from the sight of it. Will we use this for the project? Probably not, having found that other keyboard, but it is going to be a fun aside, a fun retro brighting challenge just to see how good we can make this look when it's in this kind of condition. Well, most of it, except for that single key. Johnny Five over here has bucked to the trend in his desire for more input and hasn't yellowed at all. Other markings include an SOS button where the scroll lock is and a very 90s row of buttons, including an internet button, sleep and power. I'll put them side by side now just so you can see the full impact of how different they are and how yellow that one really is or how minty white that other one is. It's quite a difference. We'll move on to the system board now, and if there's one thing I remember about mid-90s PCs, it's page files and disk thrashing. Due to the lack of physical RAM, especially as we move into the Windows 95 period and the operating system puts more demands just to run itself, let alone the applications that run on top of it, disk swapping of the page file from disk to memory and back again, uh, well, it was noisy and um, you knew about it when it was happening. So the more RAM, the merrier. Now looking at this board, we've got 16 megabytes of EDO RAM or extended data out RAM, and that's installed in a bank of two. I've picked up a couple more 16 megabyte modules for this build. These are Kingston branded. And so by installing these, it should take us up to 48 megabytes in total. Now, if you bought 48 megabytes of RAM in 1996, that would probably be in the region of 350 to 400 pounds at retail, if not a little more. Yeah, 48 megabytes of RAM. You're not laughing at my Packard bell now, are you? The CPU is an Intel Pentium at 133 megahertz, and as fun as it is to max that out, I have other faster machines here if we need that. So I'm happy to keep the CPU as stock and just retain that, well, stock experience for anyone who wants to try the machine. Well, this next item could be considered a quality of life feature by some, and I'm very grateful to viewer Declan Sweeney for sending it in. It's an original Packard Bell remote control and IR receiver. We did see this in the catalogue, so it does help us to make the build more feature complete. And Declan's letter included says, may it bring you as much frustration as it brought me. Joking aside, the Packard Bell received a lot of flack. Some deserved, but it was my gateway, pun intended, from the 8 bits to IBM PC compatibles and the still shiny Windows 95. Whether it gets used or not, this will take pride of place with the machine, Declan, so thank you for that. And checking inside, there was no sign of battery damage, so it's probably good to go with the right drivers installed. Another input device I have now is the MUSBJL mouse. What a fine piece of craftsmanship that is, and note the wavy accents in the plastics again on the top, just like the keyboard had. I think they call this design language, uh, but we'll refer to it as wibbly plastic. It's very slightly yellowed, but nothing we can't easily fix. And inside there's very little belly button fluff. The rollers also look very clean. I'll pop the ball back in there and in a display of perhaps the most frustrating to watch 30 seconds of YouTube you've ever seen, you can now watch me put the cover back on. and breathe. So that's the keyboard, the mouse, RAM, the CPU, the remote control. What else do we need to complete this system? Well, let's look back into the uh, box of dreams. And storage, of course, is the next thing. We'll test the original 1.2 gigabyte Seagate drive in the hope that we can image it to make setup easier. And I'm going to replace that spinning drive with this. It's an industrial DOM or disk on module. 
This is a flash memory device that sits neatly in the IDE connector on the system board and replaces that spinning drive, hopefully with zero compatibility problems. R1 has a 4GB capacity, less than a single layer DVD, but a luxury by 1996 standards. And I've just realised as I'm saying that, that referencing DVDs for storage comparisons is retro in itself. I mean, DVDs, do, do people even make DVDs anymore? Should I be comparing to Blu-rays, memory sticks, downloads? <laughs> yeah, either way, it's four gigabytes. And for 1996, that's a lot of space. The disc on module will not be new. I'm not sure they even manufacture these anymore. I bought it used on eBay and fingers crossed we won't have any problems with it. Let's start with testing now and power. We're going to start with the PSU to make sure that we don't put any unsafe voltages into the system. At 150 watts, it seems minuscule compared to the 1000 watts in my editing PC these days. And those fans have sucked in plenty of dirt in its lifetime. Let's pop the lid off and we'll check that there's no signs of leaks. And I couldn't see any obviously bulging caps leaking around the base of them or damage otherwise that might concern me before switching this on. So I gave it a brush and I gave it a blowout just to tidy it all up and then I plugged it in for testing. On the meter, I was getting happy readings on all of the connectors and nothing out of spec. Even after leaving it on for 20 minutes or so, it was absolutely fine. So I'm confident that it's not going to blow anything up. Next, I wanted to check out the hard disk. So I did that with an IDE to USB cable and popped it into my laptop. I would expect any partitions on this disk to use the FAT32 file system. So as soon as I plug it in, it should just pop up in Explorer and be completely readable and writable for that matter. Um, do you think we had any working partitions? Place your bets now. And the answer is the disk performed miracles. No, it didn't work but it showed up as a one terabyte drive in Windows disk management with no partitions on it. So something is up here. And then I fired up a little tool here called mini tool partition wizard. And it shows us disk three as a terabyte again, but also it shows that there's 1.2 gigabytes allocated as other. Now that's more along the size you'd expect to find on this drive, but it wasn't accessible. Now in situations where a disk doesn't just pop up and work, Windows, I find, has its limits, even if we drop into PowerShell and use the disk part tool, all very useful. But sometimes you've just got to fire up your Linux Live CD to get things done. And um, I've had a lot more success doing it that way. So let's try that now. So I fired up the Clonezilla boot CD and here it found the drive again, but it fell over identifying any partitions. So Windows, you have been redeemed. It's also identified as a terabyte drive again. There weren't any grinding noises from the disk itself, so I wonder if it's just the controller board that's at full. As a last ditch, I did try partition recovery on the 1.2 gigabyte area identified on the drive back in Windows, but it found absolutely nothing. So I'm going to put that disk to one side and if another comes my way, I'll swap over the PCB and then plug it in again and we'll see if indeed the PCB is at full and if we can recover anything. But just like the monitor, this is not going to hold up our build. We've got our disk on module and it's going to be a case of installing from scratch. Um, and that might be made easier if we can get hold of the Packard Bell Master CD, which will just put the whole image drivers, the whole lot on there as if it came from the shop, which I think I've managed to source a copy of. And uh, well, we'll find out when we get to that stage in part three. Let's try the system board now. So I've plugged the CPU in. I've cried a little bit more about the smashed monitor and I've dug out a flat screen. When I power it on, we've got good signs. The CMOS battery has unsurprisingly failed, but that's easily swapped out. It's not soldered on, it's just a coin cell. But more concerning is the prompt for a password. Are we locked out? What's the password? Trust no one, let me in. Well, thankfully it was just blank. I pressed return and it dropped us straight into the BIOS where 16 megabytes of RAM is detected. Phew. There are no drives plugged in and therefore detected, so let's plug them in now. I did try the Seagate just one last time in case there was something funky about it, but um, no, no dice, the drive is dead. So the extra RAM and the disk on module was installed. Now we have 48 megs of RAM detected in the BIOS, so that's spot on. And the DOM is detected on the secondary channel just because I've plugged it into the wrong socket. So we can swap that back over, but it's detected just fine. I then added a floppy drive, the modem slash sound card contraption, 
the LEDs and reset switch uh, PCB. And that was all fine, with the exception of the floppy drive. At first it span up and it sounded like it might function, but that sound quickly gave way to the sound of what I would describe as an angry didgeridoo. At a guess, I'd say that the motor has had it, and um, we can put it on the list to check or even replace in the next episode, but we will need a floppy drive in this build. Overall though, it was a good result and we have a working system. And what do we do with working systems? We pour water all over them. That's right, it's time for a bath. All being well, this is going to be the last Trash to Treasure series before we build a dedicated lab area to make this kind of thing easier and more regular. And if I was Mark Fix's stuff, I'd make a joke about that right now. I'd also like a larger ultrasonic cleaner, as this doesn't really fit. But the mixture of PCB cleaning solution diluted with deionized water and a few turns of the board to submerge it while it's buzzing away serves to get the job done. And I repeated this with various parts from the system. After bathing, I rinsed each part down with um, some deionized water just to wash off any remaining cleaning solution. The bath is set to 50 degrees C, although a quick poll on Twitter saw you respond by saying that 60 degrees is your preferred temperature for this kind of work. Whatever works for you, really. And I also threw in a fan for good measure because why not? Once you've got the solution in this thing, you are determined to get the most out of it. It's not the cheapest stuff. Out it all came then to dry, and it's a chance for some before and after pictures. So here's the CPU socket. And it's lovely and clean now. And then there's the video chip and it's RAM. Absolutely gleaming. And then the PCI and ISA card riser there. And that is all our internal components looking like new and laid out to drive for a few days, if not a week, because I've got no need to fire these up again until the next episode. Good progress made then today. It wasn't a huge step forward, but we've at least established that it works and we've got those internals nice and tidy. And, you know, give me a few days and I'll get over the trauma of opening that monitor box. I just couldn't believe the sound it made when I opened it, the crunch. It's the last thing anyone wants to hear when you buy this kind of kit on eBay. And to give him his credit, the seller on eBay, I bought this back in November, took a little while to um, arrive. Not his fault, it was Christmas post and then we had postal strikes and things like that. It arrived and then I left it um, in the back room for a few weeks because I wanted to open it on camera. So I didn't open it until I was in a position to do so. And so given the time that had passed, I was in no position really to ask for a refund, but he immediately put his hands up and said, okay, that's my problem. I'll deal with that even though the time has passed and I'll give you a refund. So thank you very much to that seller for that. Um, and it's not his fault. He really did pack it well. It just obviously got drop kicked by the courier at some point. So um, as I said earlier, I'm on the lookout for another monitor. I'm aware of one down in a place called Exeter, which is just south of me, but it's part of an entire um, system build and they're asking for 250 pounds for the whole lot. If they would drop down to maybe 150, I would consider it. Um, am I being tight? You tell me, but I just need the monitor. And that one that I got on eBay was 45 pounds plus 10 pounds postage. So it's a big jump all the way up to 250. One, I only need the monitor. So um, if anyone's got any leads for me, please do let me know. Once I've got one of those, in the meantime, I'm gonna do some retro brighting on the case. We'll get that looking like new. I've no doubt that whatever monitor we found, find will need some retro brighting. It's probably gonna be yellowed. The example we had today, interestingly, the whole back of the monitor was, was like pristine. It was like new, lovely and white, but it was the front bezel that had yellowed. So we might get away with just having to retro bright um, a small part at the front which makes it easier because we'd have to take the whole tube out and clean a large piece of plastic. We've just got a small piece to deal with. But deal with it we will as and when we get hold of a monitor. So um, I can't tell you when the next part will be, but um, I will be trying my damnedest to get hold of a monitor so we can finish this up. Until then, 
please do take a moment to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you haven't already done so. And um, I'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you for watching. Bye bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. If you enjoyed it and like what I do on the channel, join the official cave dwellers over at patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro.